God wants you to see that when you have no power, when you can't do anything, when you would have to say, I give up, that's when God is most powerful. This is the Breath of Life television broadcast with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. When God gets ready, he can deliver you. If you call on him, if you trust in him, he's worthy of the praise. Ooh, 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 ooh. Jesus is worthy. You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. Tonight we go to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, and there in that book there are words that are written that match the theme that we have chosen for the sermons that will be part of a series. When God steps in, the Bible says beginning with verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. And it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, we call upon thee tonight because this too is a time of hopelessness. This too is a time when many have looked into what they think is the future. and They believe that the future holds nothing for them. But we come tonight with the assurance from the word that God is still able to do things that seem impossible. So tonight, as we open thy word, we ask that more might happen than a person reading from the Bible or even commenting on a text. Let the power of the Holy Spirit be with us. All that I have and all that I am, I place into thy hands. It's not much, but use it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The time in which we live calls for perhaps a theme that is a little different. And so we have stared hopelessness in the face. We have looked at the situation that many feel is impossible and we would dare to declare that things change when God steps in. I believe that God still steps in. I am from a background that would suggest that no matter how hopeless things may seem, that God only has to determine when he's ready, and when God shows up, the whole situation is changed. I was reared in a housing project where uh, most demographers would have looked and said there is no hope. In fact, I'll make it more personal than that. If they had looked at me, if they had put me on a chart somewhere, if they had plotted out what my future would be, they would have determined this young man has no hope. But I'm proud to say to you tonight that there was a mother and a father who somehow also believed that when God steps in, something changes. And so even though we lived in a place that was surrounded by apparent hopelessness. They held on to the belief that if God is present, nothing can be hopeless. And they, among a very few other parents, made an island in that sea of hopelessness and continued to say to me and my brother, it may seem like you can't make it, but the fact is that if God is on your side, you really can't fail. And so tonight it is out of an experience that is real that I come to you with a vision that was given a prophet in a time when the people called Israel 
had resigned themselves to failure. In fact, their determination, their words were, we are like dry bones. We're alive, but we're dead. We're still around with the sensibilities to know where we are, but there is no future. They thought that somehow because they had turned against God, that God had the right to turn against them, and he did. But the fact is that you cannot understand the loving kindness and the mercy of God Almighty. The fact is that if I were to determine tonight, if I were worthy of God's mercy, I would have to declare that I'm not. But I'm pleased to tell you that I don't make the determination tonight. I'm also kind of happy that you don't make it either. It's a determination that's left up to God. And God is more merciful and more compassionate and more long-suffering than some believe. God had looked on the captivity of Israel. God had seen them fall into idolatry. He had watched them become unfaithful. And you would have thought that any God with any kind of rules would have stiffened himself and said, I'll make me another people. I'll choose somebody else. But God is long-suffering. And so he did not abandon them. Instead, he continued to reach out to them. And when they said, we're just like people who are alive, but really dead. We seem to be alive, but if you look at our future, we might as well be dead. God took their own metaphor, took their own words, put the prophet into a vision, and showed Ezekiel the very thing that the Israelites had begun to mouth with their lips. He showed the prophet bones. He said, you want to talk hopelessness? I'll talk hopelessness with you. You want to let bones represent no hope? Then let that be so. But watch what I can do with dry bones. And so in, in the vision that is given to Ezekiel, Ezekiel finds himself being moved around the valley so that he can see all of the dry bones. The scholars have looked at the text and they've come to believe that these bones were not stacked as though someone had come to bury them. They were not put as though they were about to be put into a funeral procession or into a crypt. It was as though a battle had taken place. As though nobody cared that they were dead. It was as though a slaughter had occurred and the people had gone away leaving the bones to bleach in the sun to wear away and be eaten by predators that came. Nobody cared. This is the situation that Israel had conjured up. This is the situation that God started with. Now he takes the prophet and says, let me let you see all of them. I don't want you to miss any. Because if you miss any, you might not see how grand is this dilemma. I want you to see all of it and to know that there are dry bones everywhere and they are very dry they've been there a long time now in a few moments I'm gonna try my amateur uh, effort at showing that there is something to this parallel about bones the fact is that physicians are clear to say that the stem cell that creates blood is found in bone marrow so if the bones are very dry, the marrow has dried. And if there is no more stem cell for the production of blood, man cannot live without blood. So this is not only hopeless for now, it is hopeless for the future. These bones cannot produce the very stem cell that brings blood. But God wants you to know that when you have discounted all hope, when you've looked from one end of a valley to the other, when every bone that you see is dry, when they are not stacked in an orderly fashion, but when one bone is here and another bone is there, and if you were challenged to put them together, you wouldn't be able to do it. God wants you to see that when you have no power, when you can't do anything, when you would have to say, I give up, that's when God is most powerful. 
and so he says to the prophet, take a look. Have, have you seen it all yet? Now, Ezekiel, can these bones live? <laughs> I heard evangelist Shirley Caesar uh, with a terrific analysis of how God asks questions. God is omniscient, which is to say that he knows everything. If you know everything, that means you know the answer to every question that can be asked. So no matter what God asks, he always knows the answer. All of his questions are therefore rhetorical. He knows the answer. And so when God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? It was not for the sake of information. God already knew what he was about to do. He just wanted to know, was the prophet on the same wavelength? Was he tuned in to the right channel? Was his faith up high enough to be able to comprehend what God was about to say? If Ezekiel had said, no, they can't live, then God would have known that there was not enough faith in this preacher to give him the vision. The vision might have had to go to somebody else. But I'm glad to report that the prophet was wise in his response. He neither said they can nor that they cannot live. He said, Lord, you know. You know. I don't know, but you know. Now forgive me if I get excited at the question. You see, if God shows you a situation that is impossible and then dares to ask the question, can the bones live? I don't know about you, but I get goosebumps. I begin to ask myself, what is God about to do? You know, it's a strange question to ask over dry bones, very dry bones. Why would God begin to incline my imagination in that direction? And I posit to you tonight that if you know God long enough and well enough, when God asks questions like that, you get excited. Because the fact is that God does things that man cannot comprehend. And if God had asked me the question, I'll be honest with you, I'd have gotten a little excited. Can these bones live? Lord, you know. Now, let me talk a moment about these bones. And I, I ask the forgiveness of every medical professional. You know, it's amazing. Preachers want to be doctors. Well, it's not unique. There are some doctors who want to be preachers. So... If they will forgive me for dabbling in their bailiwick a little bit, I'll forgive them for dabbling into mine and we can go forward. What do you say? I came across an article some years ago that gave me what I think is an insight into what God must have had in mind when God picked up on the metaphor of Israel. Remember that God did not have to pick up on what Israel had started. He could have changed metaphor. Since he created all language, I pause for a moment in case there are questions. I seem to remember a tower called Babel. And everybody spoke one language until God decided I will scramble them. So God scrambled the languages and my suggestion is that God created all the languages. God understanding all languages could have spoken in any one or chosen any metaphor. But instead he picks up on that. And he lets this, this prophet go into the valley. And the question is, why does God choose this one? I, I came to know that there is what forensic anthropologists call, now that, that was a pretty good term, wasn't it? <laughs> there is a new branch. The forensic anthropologist is able to take a bone nothing but a bone and begin to analyze the bone. I am not particularly enamored with bones. In fact, I have been in those little country churchyards where they have cemeteries. And I, I must tell you that I'm careful where I step. <laughs> There's no particular fear that I have, but, but no one wants to come upon a bone. But these people spend their lives with bones. And all you've got to do is give them the bone, small part of a bone, and according to how well they do, they can tell you who the person was who had this bone. They can look, for instance, at the nasal margin 
or the nasal ridge and tell you what ethnic group the person came from. Ah, no matter how much plastic surgery you get, <laughs> your bones will still tell on you. Isn't that something? Uh, bones will tell whether the person was male or female. Uh, if the person had, has a pelvis that is narrow and steep walled, uh, then that person was male. If the pelvis is broad and shallow, that person was female. So the bones tell the gender. The bones tell the height. They can take the leg bone, punch the numbers in the computer, and the computer tells this person was so tall. They can generally tell the age. Now this gets a little ticklish, so let me get to this note. If the junction between the two major bones that form the underside of the skull have closed, because, you know, the, they, the bones stay open for a while to let you have room to grow, assuming that the brain will grow, someone ought to say amen. And then the, it doesn't close for a while. So if that is still open, that means that this person is probably still a child so that up until the late teens those bones have not fused over the top of the cranium there is a zigzag mark or more than one that are called the cranial sutures they stay there until you reach the mid 20s and then there's something at the connection of one of the at the femur where the shaft meets the knob and there is incomplete calcification to suggest that you have not reached a certain age Did I spit that out right? So your bones tell how old you are. Your bones tell whether you have been left-handed or right-handed. Whether someone stabbed you at a certain point or shot you at a certain point. So bones tell who they belong to. And in fact, some of them will even begin to tell the facial features because of the way the bones are formed. Now listen, there is what they call an osteobiography so that if they had nothing but your bones left, they could begin to build a biography of your life with nothing but bones. There is a man by the name of Clyde Snow. He is the most called upon of these anthropologists. And he is one of those who can take a bone and begin to tell what the person was like. So then, if your imagination is ready to take this step, can you imagine that God might have had it in mind to suggest that when this valley is full of bones, it is full of sad stories. For bones are not just bones. Bones are biographies. Bones tell the story of people. Bones tell what your life was like. When you come to this valley in this vision, you are not just looking at dried bones. You are looking at lives, lives that had meaning, lives that had fulfillment, lives that were almost there, but some cataclysmic event has happened and life ceased. And all of a sudden you are now facing bones scattered everywhere. So that you are looking at the ultimate of hopelessness. People's lives that have come to an end. And evidently they've come to an end under some terrible circumstances. And when this prophet looks at the bones, perhaps he too draws back a little bit. But then God suggests to him, can these bones live? And when the answer comes, Lord thou knowest. Then God suggests that they can live but it does not happen under normal conditions the fact is that in god's world in god's sphere there is no challenge with sad stories now the primary implications of this text are clear if you simply read it in its context you will come to understand that this meaning should have been clear to the to the nation of israel they thought that their nationhood was forever gone they thought that they would never ever have hope to rise up again and what god is telling them is that even though you have gone away from me i am merciful enough to reach out to you 
and when I reach out to you the fact is that though it seems like you are walking dead if you walk with me if you put your hope in me I can change that situation I can make the landscape over I can switch the situations around you I can turn night into day I can turn curse into blessing I can turn failure into victory I can do that and Israel had only to listen the fact is that scores of years before his birth Cyrus was already called by name by God in Isaiah 44 the last verse God says Cyrus is my shepherd I'll use him to bring my children back to their land so while Israel was there saying we don't have any hope the fact is that God had already named the one who was to be their solution now you forgive me but I am a preacher I can't go past that one without commenting on it somebody right here might have a situation going on in your life and you're wondering how in the world can I make it past this there is no way out there are people who commit suicide because they look at their lives and they think that there is no hope they think they're alive but dead they are they are practically dead because they see no way out and I suggest to you that you really ought to look at your situation through God's eyes before you make a decision because God can see things that we cannot see so before you give up maybe you ought to let God take a look at it let the great physician take a look at your case let the one who can rule the earth who holds it in the palm of his hand let him make a decision on it before you call it off the primary implication is clear God is talking to Israel saying that you think you can't have nationhood but think again now I bring it to another level for the fact is that I am not called to preach to ancient Israel I am called to preach to postmodern America and I think that the demographers have gone too far the doomsayers no matter how many terminal degrees they may possess have only the ability to look at the fact they can only look at what is they cannot see beyond what he is and so they may be quite accurate they may come and say well judging by what we see and what we're able to determine we've looked at people in this kind of situation and we've judged it and we've put this percentage here and that percentage there we've looked at all the probabilities and we've come up to this conclusion that this group of people cannot make it They do it all the time the urban underclass cannot make it we've looked at it they they will say it's almost impossible for any child from a single parent family to thrive you can't do it and I'm not angry with them what they've done is they've taken all of the facts and fed them into their little computer and that little computer has done what computers do you feed it in it, the computer does what you're programming to do the computer cannot be blamed for what comes out at the other end it was not the computer that programmed itself it was someone perhaps a very brainy someone someone with all kinds of education who was accurate in their calculations and they put them in the computer and the computer came and said well no that group can't make it and, and these children can't make it and and those people might as well give up and, and as we look into the future certain people might as well fold up because they can't make it but you see I wish that I could guide them over to my God I wish God could let them down into the valley of dry computers let them look at dry facts and say look come come you you grand educated human being let me guide you now down to where all the facts are extrapolated look at them are they dry and they would have to declare yes Lord we have already evaluated this why do you ask <laughs> we've already seen these facts these facts are self-evident there is no hope for these people 
We have said it. We put it in the newspapers. We tried to make it as, as, as calm and quiet as we could. But certain people might as well give up. We have studied the facts. The indicators are all clear. They can't make it. And God would guide them around again and say, well, no, look at all the dry facts. Do you see them all? Can these people make it? Well, they are not so wise as Ezekiel was. They say, no, Lord. They would answer quickly. No, you see, we have... Pull it out and they'd bring all these reams of paper and pull it out. You see, here, right here, right here, right here. We come up with it. There it is, the bottom line. They can't make it. But then what they don't understand is that when God asks the question, he already has the solution. Now, I am not trying to preach utopian Christianity. I'm a little disgusted with people who act as though if you call the name of Jesus and lie down in your bed that good things will come to find you underneath your covers. I believe God feeds the birds but he does not throw the worms in their nest. What do you say? I believe that, that God rewards those who put forth effort. I would hate to belong to any group. I'd hate to I would not even purport that Christianity is good for you. If people could just sit down, and just sit there, just wait, blessings would fall upon them. What would you do? I suggest to you that, that you would be no better, in fact, you'd probably be worse if you could just sit there and blessings come and find you. And say, look, come, come, you, you grand educated human being. Let me guide you now down to where all the facts are extrapolated look at them are they dry and they would have to declare yes lord we have already evaluated this why do you ask <laughs> we've already seen these facts these facts are self-evident there is no hope for these people we have said it we put it in the newspapers we tried to make it as 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 calm and quiet as we could but certain people might as well give up we have studied the facts the indicators are all clear they can't make it and God would guide them around again and say well no look at all the dry facts do you see them all can these people make it well they are not so wise as Ezekiel was they say no Lord they would answer quickly no you see we have uh, pull it out and they'd bring all these reams of paper and pull it out you see here right here right here Right here, we come up with it. There it is, the bottom line. They can't make it. But then, what they don't understand is that when God asks the question, he already has the solution. Now, I am not trying to preach utopian Christianity. I'm a little disgusted with People who act as though if you call the name of Jesus and lie down in your bed that good things will come to find you underneath your covers I believe God feeds the birds but he does not throw the worms in their nest what do you say I believe that that God rewards those who put forth effort I would hate to belong to any group I'd hate to I would not even purport that Christianity is good for you. If people could just sit down, just sit there, just wait, blessings would fall upon them. What would you do? I suggest to you that, that you would be no better. In fact, you'd probably be worse if you could just sit there and blessings come and find you. I believe that there ought to be some effort put forth, don't you? I think some folk need to understand that. But, but understand, my, my friend, in this culture of ours, it is possible to put forth effort to do your best and still not see a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. There are some people who have more education than successful folk have, but things have not fallen right for them. They've somehow been marginalized. They've been pushed aside. All of it is not for the reasons that we suspect but there are people who have fallen through the cracks of this wonderful society of ours and they have ended up hopeless. I grew up in the neighborhood where people mostly around me were without hope. We'd wake up in the morning and we'd try to make it through another day. I have been with the little groups 
who went around trying to find out what we could tear up on that day because we never thought that we would own anything. So we did not feel part of the American dream. We felt like we were put aside and cast away. But I want to let you know that there are miracles that are still happening for people who cling tenaciously to the fact that God steps in and makes a difference. God is about to step in to this valley filled with dry bones. In fact, what he tells Ezekiel to do, he says, prophesy. Now forgive me if I allow that to be preach. Preach to the bones. Somehow I feel like I've had some church members who were not unlike that. I can remember preaching some sermons that I thought were fairly good. And I would look out in the audience and there were people. And I said, don't they know that I'm preaching power here? Don't they know that in the power of preaching, you can get up, you can stop being a dry bone and live. Evidently, they hadn't read the text. So they looked at me as though nothing would happen. God says to Ezekiel, preach to the bones. Now let me tell you something. There is something there. There is, there is a meaning there that I do not have time to pull completely out. But the fact is that we can never admit to failure when there is a God who can step in and bring success. You can't get comfortable with it. I know I have met people who seem to be hopeless. I met a man a few years ago. The man said to me, sir, I was addicted to heroin. I said, you were? He said, no, it gets, it gets worse than that. He said, I thought heroin was addictive until I found crack cocaine. He said, crack cocaine is way more addictive than heroin. Now, I must admit to you that I don't know what I'm talking about now, but I looked in his eyes and I believed him. I could read his intensity. The man said, when I found crack cocaine, I became so lost that I didn't know what to do. I said, well, sir, will you explain something to me? You say you used to be addicted to heroin and you used to be addicted to crack cocaine, but I'm looking at you now and you look okay. He said, yeah, I'm all right now. I said, but you can't get out of that, can you? Can these bones live? You can't come back from that. Not from heroin and crack. He said, but I didn't tell you the end of the story. You see, heroin was powerful. Crack cocaine was more powerful. But I found something that was more powerful than crack. I found God. God stepped into my life. And when I let God in my life, I discovered that he had more power than the addiction to crack cocaine. I don't know about crack cocaine, but I know that everybody under the sound of my voice has had some problem that you thought was too big for you. And there are some who have already come to understand that God is more powerful than your problem. If I didn't believe that was true, I would stop preaching. I'd stop preaching. But I believe that the power of God, I believe that God can step into your valley full of dry bones. I believe that God can step into your life when it's hopeless and that God has the power to speak to the hopelessness that's in your life. Ezekiel talked to the dry bones. You know, you got to have some faith to preach to dry bones. Huh? Because they don't respond much. Most preachers I know like to hear a little something. They like to at least see you shift in your chair a little bit. This preacher is challenged to go and preach to dry bones. Dry bones are inert. Dry bones have no life. Dry bones can't make noise. What can they do? You see, most of us think of bones as just being dead anyhow. But you've got to understand that if you really knew that bones are alive, I went back and did a bunch of study. I was in the library poring over books. I had a doctor to tell me which books to look for, but the doctor was kind of smart. He said, I'll help you, but I'm not going to spoon feed you. 
So he sent me down to a library, and there I was poring over these books, and I came across some information that was amazing. Way back in, in 1691, there was a man named Clopton Havers who looked at bone and came to believe that there was something going on inside of them. Most people up until then thought that bone was inert, that it was just for engineering purposes, mechanical purposes, that it was basically for posture and locomotion, that it just stood you up straight and made it so that you could walk. You know, bones. But he discovered that in these bones, there were canals. In fact, they named the canals after Clopton Havers and called them Haversian canals. And after they got the microscopes years later and began to look in the 60s, they began to see all of these blood vessels, rich blood vessels flowing through the bone so that bone is always being built up and torn down. Osteoblasts build it up and osteoclasts tear it down. Well, I read the book. So when I break my bone, and Lord, please don't let me at my age break a bone, but when you break a bone, they can put it back in a cast. It is not the physician who makes the bone go back together. They put the bone in the right place, and the bone heals. Amen? Blood in the bone. Bone knits back together. Now, when you get a little older, you've got to be careful not to fall because the healing process is a little slow. And so now I'm more careful how I step. But bone has life. Bones are alive. And when bone dies, it is a terrible situation. It's called a septic necrosis. It only happens in strange situations, but bone is alive. It's living and it's, it's changing. So when God talked about bones, they were alive, but they don't respond when they're dry. But preacher, go out and speak to the dry bones. And tell the bones, bones live. Now every preacher listening to me now knows that if you say that in your own power, nothing will happen. Every now and then, you know, I don't want to give away too many secrets about preachers, but after you preach for so long, you begin to come to think that every time you preach in God's name, something will happen. Because I tell you something, when you preach in the power of God, something happens. When the Holy Spirit gets into the words that God gives you to say, something happens. But there is a strange complex that preachers can get. We sometimes can begin to feel that we have been preaching so long with so much power that maybe we... We have it. So every now and then a preacher will go out ensconced in his or her own power. They will see some bone and say to it, arise. <laughs> but let me tell you something. It is not the power of the preacher that makes life. It is the power of God that makes life. So it has to be God moving. And, and, and so this prophet is told by God, go out in the valley, fill with dry bones, and preach to the bones. And Ezekiel has enough faith and goes out. And I don't know whether there might have been a pulpit or not. Probably not. But let's envision him out looking at the valley as far as he can see. He says, bones, arise. Now, you really don't expect for anything to happen when you preach to bones unless the power of the Holy Spirit was there. Then there came a clicking sound. What was happening was the same God who put the bones together in the first place was causing them to come together again. Now can you imagine this little teeny weeny bone here? Little bone in there. That bone is somewhere out strewn in the valley. But God knows where that bone goes. So God tells this bone where this bone is. Mm. And then tells this bone where this bone is. And you know how it goes. So the clicking is the bones coming back together. And then the tendons attach themselves. And then the muscles restring themselves. 
and the circulatory system is visible now and all of a sudden there is a form now no more bones but now the bones have taken on shape something had to happen inside the bones you remember that Clopton Havers looked in there and saw some activity going on so before God closed it up he had to make something happen inside the bones again so there's marrow there and there's power there and there's blood circulating there and now the skin comes over the bones and now instead of looking at a valley full of dry bones I'm looking now at a valley full of bodies but they're not moving yet because what we are actually looking at is the recreation of life and if you look at Genesis 2 and find out how God made man in the first place you discover that man form was formed out of the dust of the ground then God breathed forgive me I, I have read the poem too but suppose after man was formed that thing was pulled up pulled up and now The, the word, the word in Hebrew for wind, breath, and spirit, all the same. Ruach. So we know that it wasn't just breath. If you think it is, you go breathe in something inert <laughs> and see if it'll move. That was more than just wind. There had to be power. Bible says that when man was formed from the dust of the ground that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life man became a living soul the preacher stood out in the valley and according to what was told him he called to the four winds and said breath come now now the breath of God forgive me the program is called breath of life you knew I wasn't gonna pass by that didn't you the breath of life was breathed into these fleshly creatures now covered once again with skin the integumentary system the method, medical people call it now when the breath is in them they all were erect a mighty army there because of the power of god let me say this to you there may be people who the demographers have crossed off the list. There may be some single mother sitting at home watching right now thinking, I'm alive, but I'm dead. I'm alive, but I have no hope. I'm alive, but I've got to go out and, and do something strange that is against my principles in order to make it in life. Well, you, lady, need to understand that God can do anything. The bones ought to tell you something that when God speaks to impossible situations, God makes impossible become possible. Luke chapter 17, verse 28. With man it is impossible, but with God it is possible. All things are possible. Some young man who's trying to struggle and make a life for himself some young man who's trying to be a man and you know it's become a little bit more difficult now to be a man from time to time they change the paradigm one time they want you to be rough man tough then they want you to be gentle let your feminine side show we don't know what to do anymore we are confused they want you to open a door sometimes then again they don't but let me tell you instead of checking with the magazine instead of looking at the television Get on your knees and have a little talk with you. Because God is able to make a future out of no future. There may be somebody tonight locked in a prison cell. And we look at you and we say, <laughs> give up. No hope! But God gave you the vision. This vision is not just for Israel. I read in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 words that help me to understand that when I am in Christ, I am Abraham's seed. So I can justifiably claim the promises that are made to Israel. 
So if God says you don't think you can be a nation, let me make you one. I believe that somebody incarcerated tonight, you may be incarcerated for something that you did. You may have been caught red-handed, but the fact is that you don't have to stay where you are. God specializes in futures that are improbable, no, scratch that, impossible. He is the God of chances. He is the God of possibilities. God opens ways out of nowhere. But you've got to listen to the preaching of the word, not to become enamored with some preacher, but simply to let the word of God speak to your hopelessness. Let the word of God bring light out of darkness. Let the word of God breathe on your impossible situation. And God will make bones snap together. God will cover them with muscles and skin. God will breathe life into an impossible situation. And you will find that what you thought could never happen will happen because God is able. Before God stepped in, impossible. But the moment God steps in, possible. Before God steps in, a wall so thick that you can't get through it. But the moment God steps in, the wall either disappears or God enables you to walk through it. God is a God of possibility. Now, I want to make a little change in the way that we're going. We're about to to close for this evening and some of you have been caught up in the instant situation but I believe that every time the word comes to our hearts there ought to be a response and it ought not be governed by some televised program when I prepared for this message my heart was lifted again I thought about some times in my life when I had erroneously given in. I thought about some small things and somehow thoughtlessly I had assumed that God couldn't do anything about it. Or maybe I didn't even take the time to see. Maybe I didn't take the time to find out. Maybe somebody here right now is facing a situation that seems impossible and what I want to say to you before you leave is that God is able to step into your existence and speak to the impossibility so it's impossible but God can make a way out of nowhere and I know you may have come simply to to kind of encourage us so you may have come to be a part of history or oh, i don't know why you came but now the whole situation has changed god has stepped in there's something in your life that you have been treating as though it's impossible when in fact you serve a god who is so powerful that nothing is impossible to him if god allows you to go along with the situation there must be something good there for you because god is able to make changes so if you're still living with it it must be there for some reason to strengthen you to bring you along to help you to see his power because as soon as god gets ready god can speak to your impossibility and make a change i'm wondering just now before we close is there someone here who's dealing with an impossibility. Would you just slip to your feet now? Don't worry now about cameras. The cameras are no longer a faction. That's no longer an element. Let's not worry about that anymore. You've got some situation in your life that seems impossible, and tonight you want to give it to Jesus and let him talk to it. Would you just stand up on your feet wherever you are? Just, just slip to your feet now. Let God have the impossible situation. Somebody says, well, this one is too small, preacher. I, I don't think God is concerned about this one. Well, you don't know what God is concerned about. We know one thing God is concerned, isn't he? What seems small to you may not be small to him. And somebody says, well, I got a situation, but it's too big. It's too grand. 
And I wonder how in the world could you come to that conclusion when we have just seen God take a valley full of dry bones and bring the bones back to life. With God, nothing is impossible. But if there's something in your life that you'd like to put in his hands tonight, just slip to your feet before we pray. We're about to do that right now. Just slip to you. Not everybody is in this. I am aware of it. But there may be somebody who brought something impossible tonight. I'd like for you to take it home conquered. I'd like for the words of God to address it. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, tonight we have come in your name. Many of us have brought impossible situations but we have brought them to a God with whom nothing is impossible. Somebody is listening to this prayer. Someone is part of this prayer now whose problem has seemed so intractable, so, so nefarious and recalcitrant that it would not respond. Somebody has a habit that, that has been so stubborn that prayer seems to have had no effect. And, and tonight, yet again, we bring it to you because we've just left a valley that's full of dry bones and you made those bones live. And our faith is tweaked. It's sparked now. And we bring our impossible situation. We lift it in the hand of faith. And we ask that a God who is all-powerful will make a decision over that impossibility. And if glory and honor can be brought to the name of God, then let what seems impossible become possible through the power of heaven. Father, we ask this prayer. We trust for an answer in this prayer. We are even so faithful that we give thanks for the answer before it is received. Knowing that God is not a genie in a bottle, but God is a father who knows what we need. Sometimes he gives us more than we ask. He simply wants us to ask. Sometimes his answer is not according to our will, but when we trust in our father, we come to believe that God will only give us what's best for us. And so we thank thee tonight for the proper answer, for the correct answer, for the merciful answer. And we go tonight different than when we came. This is our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let everyone say, Amen. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 